Namaste everyone. Welcome to the Charvak Podcast. This is Kushal Mehra. So today's podcast is with Jonathan K. Jonathan is an editor, podcaster, and uh, I reached out to Jonathan recently. I read a wonderful essay written by Jonathan along with uh, Margaret Venti, if I'm getting her name right. And uh, it was called When Trans Activism Becomes Government Policy. And as always, whenever I come in Toronto, I message Jonathan. I was like, John, are you around? And he's nice enough. He said, come on over. Yes. So we are at John's house. We're recording this podcast at John's house. As, and as you know, the, the tradition of the Charvak podcast is <laughs> I go to people's houses and I start recording podcasts with them. John, um, we did speak last year. Last time it was, uh, you know, I was speaking with you uh, for the Colette podcast. So we've, we've turned it around to this time. It's going to be you. But uh, on the outset, John, I was just telling you offline too, that when I read this essay that you've written, I was um, disturbed. This is an issue I think that affects everyone in the sense that there are all sorts of psychological difficulties and challenges associated with growing up, I think. Anyone listening to this who's, <laughs> whose age is in double digits can identify with that. None of us have a perfect adolescence. Mm -hmm. And there is a movement, especially in the West, uh, and especially in English-speaking countries, where a lot of people who are experiencing these, these very common difficulties associated with adolescence and sexuality uh, and the changes in their life associated with puberty, they they unfortunately become vulnerable to the idea that somehow they were born in the wrong body, that they want to escape that body. Mm -hmm. um, and I think they're, at least it, it began, I think, as, as a very well-intentioned movement to help these people. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, to a certain extent, in Canada especially, it's gone overboard. And now the activist campaign to encourage young people to express the difficulties they're facing in life as being born in the wrong body and requiring surgery and pills and in, in some cases surgically altering their body and even sterilizing themselves. It, it has become a kind of, in at least some subcultures in Canada, including unfortunately education, it's become a very cultish movement and there's very little pushback in Canada. I think in other countries, especially the United States, you see a kind of culture war between people who are extremely socially conservative and, mm -hmm. and, and to my mind go too far. They actually are transphobic um, in some cases, yeah. but in Canada, there's really only one side of the debate that's been represented in any effective way. And it's pushed the entire Canadian educational and political and even media establishment in the direction of a kind of puritanical, a movement that encourages young people to blame um, being born in the wrong body for many of the problems they face in life. And it's, it's, it's having tragic consequences. You know why it's very interesting is because in my culture, uh, as people, uh, maybe most people don't know, kinner, you know, kinners are an integral part of our culture. Okay. I'm not saying Indian culture does not have transphobes or anything of that sort. I'm not even making that claim, but you know, kinners are always around us. By the way, just because we're, going to be cross posting this on the Quillette podcast. Can you just tell my listeners what, what kinders are? So kinder, uh, uh, I don't know what the English word would. Some people use the word eunuchs or yeah. some people call them hermaphrodites in English. These are all very loaded. I mean, a eunuch is somebody who, who a male who has surgically removed their testicles. Yeah, but in this case, I think uh, some, some uh, humans are just born uh, in, with certain uh, preconditions. Intersex? Uh, it, it, it's not even intersex. It's so, it's so complicated that it's not even intersex. When I was going through the definition of uh, trans, uh, what, what does it entail to be a transgender in India? And I, and I started comparing it with, uh, you know, what, <laughs> the debates over here. I was like, wait, what are we fighting about? Uh, like in India, it was not even an issue. And India officially has recognized three genders since 1947 as a democracy, as a civilization for 6,000 years. India always has. It's, it's a very normal thing in India. Okay. We have three genders in India, male, female, and kinner. Okay. We call it kinner. And now the, the, the basic difference between the West and India is India just kept on accepting subcategories under kinder what percentage of the population self-identifies as kinder kinder i think it's not more than 
two to three percent, two to three percent, nothing more than that. Okay. And and if you look at government forms in India, you will always see male, female, and other. Okay, they will give you the option. And this has been a very normal thing since years in India, which is why. And when I find uh, the visceral reactions over here, I find it very fascinating as an Indian. But the problem is that when does a reality become a social contagion? Hmm. I guess that's where the line has to be drawn, right? So first of all, I should say that uh, Canada and other Western countries have, in recent decades, enacted laws to protect the legitimate rights of people who identify as transgender, making sure, for instance, that like, you can't just be fired for your job from your job or thrown out of your apartment because you identify as trans. These are sort of what I would call normal liberal human rights policies, and, and they're, they're quite welcome. It was probably in the late 2010s that this issue started to really become a culture war flashpoint because that's when I think a lot of maybe culture critics would say it stopped becoming a normal liberal anti-discrimination movement, which certainly people like me welcomed, and started to become more of an active means for people to expand the idea of gender dysphoria. People stopped seeing it as something that should be accommodated in the same way as religion should be accommodated and race should be accommodated as a way to prevent discrimination against those groups. And it became more of a promoted means of explaining away a broad range of difficulties that people face in society, people maybe suffering trauma, people who are wrestling with their sexual orientation and maybe are looking for an alternative explanation for why they're attracted to people of the same sex. And you started to see the numbers explode. In particular, you started to see the numbers of trans-identified people explode among uh, young female adults, teenagers, adolescents, often in clusters. Lisa Lippman, who was a researcher who was then affiliated with Brown University, uh, did the first, published the first peer-reviewed research on what came to be known as ROGD, which rapid onset gender dysphoria, where you had groups of girls would suddenly all declare that they were, were trans. That's not the only explanation for gender dysphoria. There are some mm -hmm. people who really do suffer legitimate forms of gender dysphoria. And I think if it's persistent, they, they certainly deserve access to therapies, which I should say that some conservative Republican states, they're trying to deny them that, which I don't think is the right policy. But as this social contagion started growing, so did the, the idea that you're not allowed to talk about the social contagion, because if you talk about it, it means you're less likely to support what came to be called affirmation. And affirmation is the idea that you just, when a child of whatever age comes forward and declares themselves to be transgender, you just automatically reflexively affirm that self-conception and proceed to therapies, which eventually often do include, unfortunately, dangerous pharmacological and surgical therapies that can result in horrible side effects and sterilization. What grown adults do should not be anybody's problem, in my view. Mm -hmm. After the age yeah. of 18, I mean, there could be a debate. Uh, science says that the frontal lobe is developed after the age of 25. So should we... I mean, I'll just say, you need to pick some legal... Yeah, so we yeah, need point. to pick some legal points. So, I mean, I'm personally fine with 18. Mm -hmm. After what grown adults do with their body after the age of 18 is none of my business. But for the benefit of uh, Quillette... Uh, listeners, John, I do have the definition of a transgender, the legal definition of the transgender as per the Transgender Protection of Rights Bill 2019. This is in India. Yeah. Okay. By the Ministry of Social Justice and Welfare. There is a social justice ministry in India, in case people did not know. And it says this bill defines a transgender person as one whose gender does not match the gender assigned at birth. It includes, and this is where the the uh, expansion comes trans men and trans women persons with intersex variations gender queers and persons with socio-cultural identities such as kinner and hijra so they have clearly separated them too intersex variations is defined to mean a person who at birth shows variation in his or her primary sexual characteristics external genitalia 
chromosomes or hormones from the normative standard of male or female body. So it's a very comprehensive definition. And this is India. And they have done it. And why this bill was done was basically you cannot now discriminate against any of these people in residence, in employment, in education, in healthcare. It, it sounds like a kind of standard anti-discrimination law, yes. which is great. Yes. Just to be clear, I know very few people here in Canada who would object to that kind of legislation. I mean, we've had that kind of legislation in Canada for many years, it's, and it wasn't particularly controversial, nor should it be controversial. What became controversial was when, in the late 2010s, when what was originally an anti-discrimination movement felt more like a socio-political movement that some people felt had a recruitment aspect to it, um, where you had people in schools who were encouraging children to maybe blame a lot of their problems in life, because everyone has problems, um, on this phenomenon. And it started to become embedded in government policy in a way that went beyond anti-discrimination. So I think it's very interesting that, that India is up to date on this. I think it's great. Liberal anti-discrimination laws are foundational building block of humane democratic society. But what we're looking at, especially in Canada, goes, goes beyond the kind of phenomenon that that kind of law, I believe, was designed to address. Okay. I got very confused with this paragraph in your essay where you said in 2022, Trudeau's government announced something called two S L G B T Q I plus action plan. Like you said, the digits never end, first of all. Yeah. And and then it says, which was described as a quote, a whole of government approach to achieve a future where everyone in Canada is truly free to be who they are and love who they love. Now, what does this mean that if you're a kid and if you want to get a surgery, even if your parents don't consent to it, it will be allowed? I certainly don't think it's as simple as a child just showing up to a clinic. Although you have had child services official go after parents who were not willing to, quote unquote, affirm their child's belief that they were born in the wrong body, which to me, the idea of being born in the wrong body is, is a kind of religious idea. It's uh, um, almost like you want to exercise spirits from your body. And I, that, that's one of the reasons I object to some of the extremes in this movement, because they, it does have religious overtones. It seems like almost like an ersatz religious faith. And what many parents complain about, and not just like religious Christians and not just religious Muslims, although they've been at the, the, on, on the lead of this pushback, uh, but also many um, lesbian and gay activists who believe that this is a campaign that's homophobic. How? In the sense that you have, in, in all, many, many examples, you have a confused gay teenager who is being bullied because they're gay. To them, the way to resolve the cognitive dissonance and say, well, I'm really straight, it's just I'm a straight person who's trapped in this gay body. Yeah. And it becomes a way to reinvent yourself in a way that, you know, maybe now I won't be bullied. Maybe now I'll be a new person. Maybe those negative feelings belong to a person in the past, which is why you get this stigma against dead naming. Can you explain what dead naming is? So let's say I'm, my name is John Kay. And I say, no, my name isn't really John. It's uh, Brenda. And anybody who calls me John is performing this hate, hate crime because they're referring to this person in the past who no longer exists. I'm now female. Uh, when I was male, I was tortured and everything was horrible because the world didn't see me. I didn't see myself as I truly was. Um, it's, it's kind of born again idea, right? Like referring to yourself, you know, as a pagan when really, you know, now I'm a Christian and don't talk about my pagan life. That's, that's, that's a horrible period of my life. I want to confine to the past. That's fascinating. The, the dead naming thing I find very creepy. I, I've written, written about this elsewhere. I have a friend who went to, it was a, effectively a lesbian wedding here in Canada, which is it's fine. It's very common. Yeah. Uh, it's been common here for, for decades. But one of the women very recently started identifying as a man. And in the photos that were at the wedding and in the speeches, no one was allowed to refer to period of this person's life before they had transitioned a couple of years ago. 
so you know all the photos on the table all the speeches were kind of done in this very unsettling thought controlled way like time began a few years ago in this person's life they were just sort of like dropped from a spaceship onto the earth as a man and everything preceding it was this no go zone in terms of showing pictures of them or their art projects anything that showed that they were actually a girl or a woman and to me that's like a very soviet way of reinventing history Korea. in the christian cultural tradition the, the the idea of a road to damascus moment when you know saul of tarsus becomes paul the great founder of the christian church like on a smaller scale there are a lot of equivalents to that in these movements where um people have an epiphany and they realize who their true self is there's i mean putting aside gender and religion there's a lot of like self help movements that are based on this idea uh you know tony robbins you know like discovering the person within discovering the giant within the idea that there's this incredibly confident successful person buried in the soul of of everyone around and you just have to discover them and to some extent the really activist fringes of the tra- the trans movement because it has has many components does kind of resemble that where once you discover this essence of a person you are you're just going to be happy and fulfilled and you're going to radiate they call it trans joy trans liberation i mean th- these phrases i it's in the article that that you read have actually become part of government literature which again have the air of kind of religious literature sounds like somebody's writing a bible uh, oh it's yeah i mean i don't think it's a coincidence that canada is a it's a post christian society which i mean suits me fine i'm i'm jewish and i'm not especially religious and i uh i, I don't want to live in a <laughs> any kind of christian theocracy certainly but there is a uh to to cite a phrase there's a god shaped hole in the con- in the political consciousness of many canadians i want to talk about a it. lot of these canadians you talk to i mean it's clear in some cases like i actually know many of the most progressive canadians i know they grew up in religious christian at least culturally christian families mm-hmm. and at least on some subconscious level they're looking for some kind of replacement for the articles of faith and the rituals and and it isn't just the gender stuff you also get the land acknowledgments like i am a settler i am living on stolen lands the sin that resides in my heart shall always stain my legacy you give it back and and also and also uh the work of decontaminating my soul shall be the work of a lifetime it shall never be complete i shall disrupt my consciousness i shall live in uncertainty and pain like it's a kind of um it's a confessional reflex yes it's also a self really? self flagellation reflex Absolutely. and but and not not to pick on canada i mean we kind of all have this like to some extent many of us you know guilt <laughs> guilt is part of the human condition and it takes political expression in many societies um in all kinds of movements um in in canada right now it's you know some of the gender stuff but mm-hmm. every time someone says a land acknowledgement again very well intentioned a lot of it when i listen to it um you know you kind of see the the glassy eyed recitation of these things it's like these people are a church um these people are channeling some kind of cultural reflex they have they don't quite know what to do with it because they don't go to church on sunday they don't go to confession they have that reflex and this is one of the things they put it into this idea that Well, I might not have religious this is my new thing sin but but I have a kind of political sin, sin. and it crosses generate this is this to me is very creepy that it crosses generations you see people on Canadian social media apologizing for stuff that like their ancestors did 5 or 6 generations ago Why should I apologize for anything it's really creepy um now look again there's uh, there's there's some green of truth to it like you know if If you're a stockholder in a corporation that did horrible things 40 or 50 years ago and you feel like well okay I've profited from that I mean it's or if you're like your family did stuff when you were a kid and you kind of like knew it was wrong and you didn't say anything I mean I can see where the impulse comes from um 
humans aren't just social creatures, we're ancestral creatures. We, we like to honor the legacy of our relatives and, you know, we're proud if our, if our ancestors did wonderful things. Yeah. Uh, ancestor worship is a huge part of many cultures and even survives in some, yeah. So it, it's not as if, it's not as if Canadian progressives invented this intergenerational well, absolutely. reflex, absolutely. but it's taken expression in Canada in, in a very unsettling way. So, so John, in many ways, from what I get, this sounds like a crisis of meaning that happens in many yeah. Christian societies in the West where, um, and you know, John, it's uh, a lot of it has to blame with folks like you and I. Yeah. This, we, <laughs> you know, uh, we, the disbelievers who attacked religion and its excesses. And then we, you know, when religion said, okay, yeah, maybe this was a little too much. We'll correct this. We kept on smashing them. We kept on smashing them. We kept on smashing them. So do you think we as uh, disbelievers, part of the movement of, okay, I am a different kind of disbeliever from an Indian pantheon, but you know, we've all been there. Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, uh, Daniel Dennett, the Four Horsemen, New Atheism, and look what they gave us. Sometimes the reflex to bash your own tribe becomes its own kind of tribalism. So if you live in a very intensely nationalistic environment mm -hmm. where let's give it, you know, let's say you live in the United States mm -hmm. and Trump has just been elected. And everyone around you is walking around with these MAGA hats and they're talking about make America great again. And they're saying things that you regard as xenophobic and build a wall. It's not unnatural that you would go on social media and say, my tribe does not include these people. My tribe is the people who push back against this. And that becomes its own kind of tribe, a sort of anti-nationalist, a sort of anti-tribe. And social media makes it very easy to create an anti-tribe because Twitter in particular rewards oppositional postures. Absolutely. Oppositional postures. Um, and by the way, in some parts of the world that can be very, become very, very dangerous. If you're, if you're in Saudi Arabia and you say, well, you know what, my, my oppositional tribe is I hate Wahhabism. And I'm gonna, start, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel where I talk about how horrible Wahhabism is. You're gonna end up in jail. In, in, in the United States and Canada, on the other hand, you're gonna end up an assistant professor at a local college. We live in a society, or Canada, which I kind of like. I mean, I like the fact that you can make a career and a reputation by opposing the dominant culture. However, in Canada, especially, I would say that anti-tribe, that mm -hmm. tribe built, built around guilt and bashing what Canada was, and you know, people who say, oh, you know, the occupied colonial lands known as Canada, that has kind of become the dominant tribe itself on college campuses in government literature uh, certainly in the arts community the the anti-tribe has become the dominant tribe but it continues to present itself as oppositional so you often will see it's kind of hilarious actually like you often hear these activists or educators saying we have to disrupt education we have to disrupt the dominant narrative and I look at, and I, then I look at who's funding these organizations and it's like the major banks, it's the Canadian government, it's the provincial government, it's the city government. It's, so I was like, well, who are you going to disrupt? Like, you, you know, your whole activist career is based on getting grants from every major institutional player in Canadian public life, including in many cases, big publicly held corporations. Yeah. So the conceit that you are disrupting anything is wearing kind of thin because at least when it comes to the commanding heights of Canadian education, activism, media, um, a lot of people would say what needs disruption is kind of this incessant dogma that is, is built around a kind of Canadian anti-tribalism. And I think there has to be a balance. Like I don't, I don't want to live in a society where it's illegal or even highly stigmatized to criticize your culture or your government or, or your history. Like Canada's done lots of terrible things. It's, it's like every country. Um, I would say maybe it's done, it's less blood soaked than, than most countries, but I also don't want to live in a society where talking endlessly about that and more importantly, regarding it as a stain on your own personal air sats, religious soul becomes its own kind of cult. And unfortunately that's what a lot of Canadian public life has become uh, sort of rituals of self-flagellation that channel 
this this movement because you see a lot of people some of the same people who say oh i'm a guilty settler living on stolen land and i shall forever mm -hmm. work on reconciliation and they're often the same kind of people who will say uh, i'm a white ally who supports black lives matter and i will forever think about my white privilege and ways to erase myself from the white supremacist power structure and then they're also the same kind of people who are like i am a heteronormative cis straight person who is very conscious of my privilege and endeavors on a daily basis to help trans people and non-binary people navigate this intensely phobic society we live in a lot of these ideas are fungible it's kind of the same movement it just projects itself on different aspects of, of the human condition so i i have an outsider's perspective to this country i just look at it observe talk to people and like i was with my friends and you know i was like why does everything about have to be about either white aggression or white guilt? I, I actually asked this to my It's friends. actually incredibly narcissistic by white people is they think that people who aren't white go around thinking all day about what white people think about them. Yeah. Which they don't. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it, it, and I could see it as an outsider, but I did not like, I would hear my friends, they would constantly self flagellate on Facebook. I had to unfollow some of them. I could not take their self-flagellation. I'm like, just stop. I Yeah, so I for me, that was... Do you remember a couple of years ago, there was that horrible Islamophobic attack in Christchurch, New Zealand? Yes. Horrible thing. And it was just, I mean, it was, it was the, the guy put it on Facebook. And I mean, it was just a horrible, horrible, horrible yes. thing. But I remember there were people I respected here in Canada who said, it is the duty of... This became like a popular meme for about 15 minutes. It is the duty of every white person in Canada to reflect on the white supremacist culture that allowed this to happen. And I remember thinking like some racist nutbag on the other, literally on the other side of the planet does this horrible thing and I have to spend the day in church. Why? No, but it's like for some people it's Yom Kippur every day. Yeah. And I'm like, there's That's horrible so people doing horrible things around the planet all the time. And if I have to like, get on my knees and beg for forgiveness because of all these nutbags, there's 7 billion people on the planet. <laughs> like a lot of them are nutbags and a lot of them are white and a lot of them are male and a lot of them are straight. So I'm not going to apologize for stuff that every member of that group yeah, does. Like it's so just, true. we all fall into 50 different categories. It's frustrating. But it's, it's, it's a part of that reflex that says, I'm going to apologize for what my great grandfather did. The fact that this guy's white and living in New Zealand, I don't know this guy. I mean, yeah, he's a horrible, horrible person. And it became very difficult because you know what? So as you and I are, one of the reasons we're friends is we both like to laugh and tell jokes and, yeah. and, and see life in a funny way. But once that person posts that thing on Facebook and, and everyone in the comments is required to say, yes, you know, I'm in, I'm in, you know, um, immediately it destroys my capacity to bond with that person in any kind of real intellectual way, which requires an allowance of context, of irony, of satire. It's not something I can even put because it would be seen as so insulting as like, you know, get off your, get off your knees. Like, you know, you want to make the world better, go volunteer at your local food bank, you know, yeah. sitting here reciting prayers about your, your, the white stain on your soul is it's not going to help the victims in, in New Zealand, which by the way, I know people live in New Zealand. It's a very enlightened liberal society. Like, the idea that it's a white supremacist society is, is, is ridiculous. There are there are criminals in every society, and if we define ourselves according to the worst specimens of humanity, what does that do to public debate? It's like I mean, it's it's no better than defining ourselves by reference to the saints and martyrs of our society, exactly. and saying like, well, you know, I, I'm so proud to be a white person because of like this heroic thing that this white guy did the other day. Like I would never, it'd be crazy to think that, but much in the same way, I'm not gonna think, wow, I really have to work on my racism because some nutbag in New Zealand did this. Like it's, it would be crazy. Everyone would know it's crazy to think of the positive example of that. We should also think of it as crazy in terms of the negative example of that. Yeah. You know, I've gone through the whole process of being someone who had faith, then lost his faith then who went into the phase of the ultra hyper patriot uh, phase. And I, I have lost all of that too. That's why I, I'm just all over. The when place. you say hyper patriot, you mean like 
Indian my country beach? is amazing okay. I, mean, I don't think India is bad or anything I live there it's by done choice. some pretty incredible things yeah, okay. I, I live there by choice not by compulsion uh, I, I have the choice I've been married to a Canadian but uh, I could have moved to Canada anytime I wanted to but I still stay there my country has problems uh, like any other country uh, in some cases more I've just lost that maybe a, a moment of tribalism in my brain it's not that I'm a globalist or of any kind. I still believe in nation states. I believe in boundaries. I believe the idea of a nation state still makes sense from a governance perspective, not from any other perspective. I think it's easier to govern when you have nation states. You, and especially in a neighborhood like India, which has Pakistan as a neighbor, we're very hostile neighbor. So we, we need this. Oppositional geopolitics can sustain national tribalisms. Because if you always have to be on guard against, you know, if you're if you're in South Korea and you're on guard against North Korea, Pakistan, India, Russia, Ukraine, uh, for many years, Canada, United States, there was like this fear of cultural takeover of Canada by the yes. United States. So these kind of oppositional geopolitical contexts can sustain nationalism as a tribalizing force. Yes. Right now in Canada, I mean, Canada doesn't have a Pakistan. Canada doesn't have a North Korea. And even the United States, like Canada used to have a nationalism that was based on a kind of cultural fear of mm -hmm. U.S. takeover. That's been destroyed by social media because Canadian progressives now feel the sense of kinship with American progressives. And American conservatives and Canadian conservatives now feel this kinship. So social media has caused a vertical sort of tribalism along yeah, ideological lines, as opposed to the horizontal tribalism that you saw at the, at the Canadian Canada US border. So as a result, this is one of the reasons that that Canadian progressives have gone so loopy is they don't just have a god shaped hole in their brain, they have an anti American shaped hole in their brain, because the entire progressive Canadian establishment uh, during the cold late Cold War period, even very early 2000s, when I started work as a journalist, um, had a I would say well-founded fear that Canada is this tiny country and we're going to get swallowed up by American sitcoms and American singers and American politics and American trade. And they're going to swamp our market with their products. And, you know, uh, no one's going to watch our TV shows and no one's going to, no one's going to read our authors. Um, and so this whole idea of cultural protectionism, although I, I thought a lot of this was, was overwrought, at the very least, it had the benefit of creating a kind of bonding idea within Canadian intellectual circles that say, well, you know, we stand for something. We are, we, we're beleaguered by the United States and we have to take steps to protect this identity. And it's a positive identity. Being Canadian was seen as this kind and gentle yeah. thing. Pacifism, multilateralism. Um, you know, as recently as the mid 2010s, this progressive magazine I used to work at, like, I think it's motto was the world needs more Canada. And just a couple of years ago, the idea that the world needs more Canada suddenly became like, that was like hate speech. It's like the world needs more Canada. It's like the world needs more genocide. Like it, because such a decent society. Canada. It's a wonderful society. But in the late 2010s, there was this very sudden and abrupt phase shift among Canadian progressives where it went from Canada is a light unto other nations in regard to pacifism and multilateralism as opposed to the United States, which was all, you know, we, we had a, a thicker social safety net and there was a lot of pride. And in the space of just a few years, that was just inverted on itself, large part, not entirely because of social media, but that was a big factor. And suddenly it was like, we're no different from the United States. We're a blood soaked genocidal state, especially in regard to indigenous people. Uh, we went in hard for the Black Lives Matter movement, despite the fact that Canada's uh, doesn't even have an issue over here. Well, so the what's what's into what's really interesting now. But look, racism affects every society. Yeah, and, I mean, and, I faced it uh, in my college over here. Mm -hmm. However, um, what what you, you now have this movement in Canada that insists that Canada was a historically active mover on the slave trade and that we should be apologizing for our role in the slave trade and despite the fact that the british empire abolished slavery several decades before canada came into existence mm -hmm. but it has become this mainstream position in canadian progressive circles that no less than the united states canada 
was a player in the global slave trade. It is completely ahistorical, but if you point out the fact that Canada came into existence several decades after the British Empire abolished slavery, you're shouted down as being some kind of denier of Canada's historical crimes. But the real root of it is that a lot of the people who are making this point, they live their lives on social media, and in particular, American social media. And so when the United States went in for Black Lives Matter, we went in for Black Lives Matter. When the United States went in for, you know, the reparations movement, we went in for the reparations movement. And in a way, the United States really has taken over Canadian culture, which was, as I said, was once the greatest fear of Canadian progressives, but they've taken it over through social media and they've taken it over, I'd say, from the left and through academic movements that have kind of turned a lot of Canadian progressives into clones of their American counterparts because they all inhabit the same social media backwater. Like I remember Justin Trudeau doing his performative uh, song and dance for Black Lives Matter very clearly. Oh, he went down on one knee. Yeah, he went down on one knee. Yeah. And uh, and uh, he just announced that he's coming for the G20 summit to India. I just hope he doesn't dance like a Bollywood star. He is not going to do that again. No, John. He's definitely not. No, 100%. He's not. He's going to, you know what? He's going to be a suit and tie and he's going to get off the plane. And I guarantee if somebody plays some music, you'll see his body start to twitch, but he'll he'll control it. He'll be like, no. Like, I don't even understand this bit in your article where you said Trudeau's 2022 action plan instructed Canadians to adopt the term 2SLLG, 2SLGBTQ1 yeah, yeah. plus it, instead it, it, of LGBT. What, what the hell is 2S now? The 2S is a term that was invented in the late 20th century. It means two-spirit. And two-spirit became this umbrella term to indicate indigenous conceptions of other genders, sexual orientations. The term can't really be defined. In fact, I cited in the article, there was this, an Ontario teachers union wrote a big report, spent a year trying to figure out what the definition of 2S is. Mm. They admitted in the report that we can't figure out what 2S means, but you, to be 2S, all we know is that to be 2S, you have to be indigenous and anti-colonial. I'm like, wait a sec. You can't even tell me if it's a gender identity or a sexual orientation, but you are telling me that you have to have a certain kind of political attitude to qualify for it. And again, this was an Ontario teachers union that spent a year looking at the issue, like the document they produced, which I read and I, I cited in this article was supposed to favor the use of the 2S term. Like they were trying to support it, but they couldn't figure out how to define it. And What's happened is the term 2S, first of all, it's kind of completely reductionist. Like Canada was inhabited by, by hundreds of different indigenous societies before European contact. Some of them, it's true, absolutely did have categories they used for maybe what we would now call effeminate men or like, the, you know, every society has to find ways of integrating everyone who defies gender roles in their society. Um, yeah, I can understand. My society does. Sure. And um, so, I mean, again, there's like there's some truth to the this idea that all these societies had these these categories, but 2S became this reductionist term that basically meant what a white person conceives of as an enlightened indigenous person who has like blue hair and cross dresses. Like that's kind of in the Canadian arts and activism community if you wanted to get, get a grant or you wanted to present yourself as this, it was sort of like every white person's understanding of like this mystical indigenous gay slash trans person, except you weren't really supposed to call them gay or trans or non-binary because you no, know, it's two S this term. No one can to this day can define, but the real political function of the term two S has been co-opted by white people, which is to give this sort of aura of ancient, mystic indigenous wisdom to what is essentially a white campus upper class movement absolutely and it is culturally imperialistic it is appropriative yes. it's all the all the thought crimes that are attributed to right-wing people in canada this is like <laughs> it's a paradigmatic example of it it's, yeah. it's embarrassing on the other hand it, the movement has actually has a lot of profiteers because 
if, if you're looking for a grant, if you're looking to be on some kind of literary panel, if you're looking to get your poem accepted by um, some kind of recherche Canadian magazine, if you can say, not only am I Indigenous, I'm two-spirited. It's like you check two boxes. The editor or the recruiter... Then cannot say no. They, well, they can, maybe they can say no. They, they've said, well, we have someone who's three-spirited. But they can't ask you... What exactly do you like? We know what transgender means. We know what gay means. Non binary, we kind of know what it means. Yeah. Two spirit is the only thing where it's like, don't ask. Like, you're not allowed to ask, literally, because um, it's seen as something that's opaque to you and me. Like, you literally, again, this is in the document I cited, you have to be anti colonial to get it. And you have to be indigenous. Like it's it's a racial essentialist form of gender identity, where unless you have the correct racial bloodline, you can't you can't do it. It's it's a really weird thing that backdoors us into kind of race essentialism. Like if I said, "Well, I'm, I'm I have this weird gender identity that's only Jewish people can have." That would be weird. Like people in Canadian society, if I say I'm like, I'm Jay spirited, you don't get it because you don't go to synagogue. Like that'd be pretty screwed up, but it's the same logic. It's absolutely the same logic. And I said, and they said, well, what do you have to be to be Jay spirited? So it's like, well, you have to be Jewish and you have to oppose anti-Semitism. That's the same as saying you have to be indigenous. This, opposed this to sounds like creationism. And uh, I don't know how else to say it. This is like uh some left it's really wing screwed up. it's very screwed up left wing progressive flat earth shit but this gets this gets back to our original thing it's like the same kind of people who are like you know buying dream catchers for their cars and they wear special bracelets to keep off like evil energies and like there is this hunger and i get it i mean there's this hunger for a conception of the because universe it always wins whereas John. it does always win it and it always wins it, no yeah. matter how much you and i try yeah and and I'm, i and again i'm i'm not an anti-religious activist i mean i kind of like i have a different you have a more coherent worldview when it comes to this stuff um i'm more like a professional eye roller i don't offer leave me alone yeah you're I, the you're the old atheist who just wants to be left I, alone i don't want to go to synagogue i'm the jew who doesn't want to go to synagogue and and <laughs> And it, you can't fool me by saying, well, it's not a synagogue. It's, um, you know, it's a land acknowledgement and a pronoun check and uh, a DEI session. Do you want to come? I said, no, no, no. You, you think I'm stupid? I, I know what a religious service looks like. Like, I'm not an idiot. Like, just because you're, there's no Torah doesn't mean it's not religious oh, like so it's, it's just insane but I, I but i'm not starting my own church i'm not starting yeah. my own synagogue i just don't want to go to yours yeah it's, it's it's interesting you know john people like you and i sometimes uh and maybe we can end it over here and uh, you know people like you and i we don't realize how much religious privilege we have i think this world <laughs> is built by religion we have media privilege yeah. i mean see this thing we can be professional shit disturbers like that and that is kind of like so the I, the notion of privilege, I'm not, I, I don't discount it. that. Yeah, there is privilege, privilege, money, access to capital, access to education, you know, uh, good health. You know, you travel around the world. I, uh, I don't travel as much as you, but I'm able to get on a plane and go places and have fun. And, but, but the other source of privilege I have is that I have this job where I'm able to take the piss out of things and people pay me money for it. Yeah, Whereas most you. people, including probably most people listening to this, don't have that they privilege. Don't. If you're, a, and you know, if you say something that the people you work with disagree with, left or right, you're going to, unlike us, we get rewarded for it. Yeah. Like, we're, so, so I, I do, I, this is one of the forms of privilege I unironically acknowledge. Uh, you know, and, and it's fun to live this kind of life and fulfilling. Um, but I recognize not everybody, you know, can just walk around um taking the piss out of everything the way we do yeah i i and, and and i understand which is why i i feel at times for people like you and i it is our moral responsibility because we have been blessed with a blessed not in a spiritual sense but just blessed but you know what the reason i do it isn't because i feel more responsible the reason is i can't shut up if i if i see <laughs> this crap going on 
there are people like, you know, I don't know if you have this in India, but you have it in your neighborhood. These people who put up signs on their front lawn says in this house, we believe in. And then it just lists this laundry list of like progressive tenants. No, they would be called crazy. In India. So but we had this we had this. Uh, you don't see those signs anymore, but it says it starts in this house. And then it says, we believe the following. And it's like essentially a political statement okay. of like hyper progressivism. I'm sure you've seen it without realizing. Maybe you thought it was a this is their religious symbol. Yeah, of course. It's a mezuzah. It's a mezuzah. Yes. It's, a, it's a lawn mezuzah. Just in the same way, like having seven masks on your face is yeah. a face mezuzah. Or having an Om symbol or a cross outside yeah. your house. Yeah. Uh, by, this sign, by, by this sign, we shall conquer. It's um, 99 out of 100 people pass that guy's house and don't say anything. I'm the guy who who wants to knock on the guy's door and say, really? Like, you know, just like, is this for a tax, a religious tax? Shit starter. But I have to, I have to remind myself, it's his right to do that. I have to remind myself, it's his right to wear seven masks when he's playing golf by himself. It's his right to tell me his pronouns. It's his right to say a line. And it is his right. I love the fact that I live in a country that people can can do all this stuff i just don't want to be forced to do it myself that's the only thing i, I don't want i think that's that uh, we could not have uh, ended <laughs> ended this discussion uh, in a better way john i it's always a pleasure talking to you i uh, i always look forward to meeting you whenever i'm in toronto you know uh, at least once a year we get to meet we get to hash things out yeah. uh, whether the world has collapsed or not but uh, i wish you all the best and i hope to see you once again next time once again one day we're going to do this in india oh yes uh, in my house yeah yeah